Yes, it's such a pleasure to be here. And um, well, I was going to say a pleasure to talk about this, but there, um, we'll, we're going to start in a dark place. Sorry. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to talk about this, but but um, as I was saying, uh, we're going to start in a little bit of a dark place. Um, so what we're going to look at is mental health and medical students' challenges and opportunities, and there's there there much. Uh, um, out there, uh, and and we'll kind of look a little bit at the history, and um, uh, first, uh, no conflicts of interest. Um, just once, I'd love to say I have a conflict of interest. Wouldn't that be great if somebody actually could? If there is none, um, if there was just some medication that we could just get rid of all of this, right? Fix all of this. Um, so we're going to start with the healthcare setting, somewhat grim picture. Um, we're going to start with medical students. And do people have a sense of, of mental health stats in medical schools? I'll, I'll just show you. Basically, I, I always want to say just about every study ever done, but it's really every study ever done, has shown um, basically numbers that look like this. So depression rates 20 to 30 percent. Um, anxiety and burnout gra rates greater than 50 percent. So a, a, a majority of medical students, it appears, have anxiety and burnout rates. And just to give you a sense of what those numbers look like, that the, this age cohort um, should have depression rates of about 4 to 5 percent. And actually, we've looked at it in our own medical students, and that's what they start out. So they, they start with mental health looking like the rest of the general population, um, but th that changes quickly. Um, residents, maybe even worse. Um, 60 to 75 uh, percent burnout rates, even higher in some settings. Um, I guess probably very notable here in this city, two interns committed suicide this last year in August or something like that at another, at another institution. Um, we don't know suicide rates. It's not tracked um, when you look at, uh, at residents. Practicing physicians, um, depression, suicide rampant. Um, suicide uh, physicians now have the highest rate of suicide of any profession. Um, they've, we have passed dentists, which um, shows how grim things are. If we've passed dentists, there's a serious problem. Um, the other way to look at it is um, two large size medical school classes out of the 120 or 130 medical schools in the country, two of those classes are required to replace the physicians who've killed themselves the, the year before. So imagine these big auditoriums, two big auditoriums of students just needed to um, replace those who com committed suicide the year before. Uh, burnout rates uh, through the roof. Um, and this one, which is a change, is they would not recommend the field to their kids. A number of, they aren't really scientific studies, more done by um, search firms and things like that, but with our large ends, and it's 60 to 90 percent. So there's a crisis out there. I mean, th and I don't think there's any doubt. I, if anybody, you know, thinks there isn't, I'm happy to debate that, but I, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem. And, and given the nature of this problem, the depth of this problem, you know, the question is, so what's being done about it? And particularly when you think about this isn't just taking a toll on um, the physicians, it has great risk for affecting the care of patients because there's just work you know, emerging that seems to indicate that depressed physicians are more likely to make medical errors. Burned out physicians are less likely to be empathetic and, and provide appropriate care for their patients. And that, that's just emerging. So not only is this a physician issue, I think it's a public health issue as well. So what's being done? Bottom line is not enough. And the, the really, I think, startling thing about this is, is maybe the depth of this problem maybe is being better understood. Uh, but a lot of this is not new. I look back at the medical education and medical literature. This was being reported in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and, and when you look at the track record of medical education and medicine in terms of dealing with this, um, it, it, it's very, for me, it's disturbing. And it, I think it says something about the culture of medicine and medical education, which is problematic. So St. Louis University Medical Student Mental Health. I got to St. Louis U about 10 years ago. And 
worked there for the first few years, and I don't know how I got interested in the, in the subject. I guess I just started reading about this in the medical education literature, seeing about the depression and suicide, or depression and anxiety rates. And I think what, what impressed me was I, I said, wow, I, our, that isn't what our students look like. They seem happy. They smile at me. Um, the GQ graduation questionnaire results were great. High level of satisfaction with the school. High level of satisfaction through the roof with administration. They were very happy with us. But we did something which was really, I think, ultimately really smart and, and, and risky in, in many ways, which rather than assuming everybody was OK, we decided to ask. And so what we did was we surveyed them anonymously. Um, and I will not forget the day when I first saw our first results. Um, these were our numbers. So moderate severe depression symptoms as measured by the CES depression scale, done anonymously. The class of 2011, the class of 2012, they're at the end of the first year of medical school, 27%. And then if you look at second years, 28 to 35% of them were, had moderate to severe symptoms of depression. And I work with a psychologist. He said some of these people, you, the scores they had, these were like, these were people who you would think about hospitalizing. I mean, these were severe, unbelievably high scores, right? Um, so that was uh, depression and anxiety rates. I mean, all above 50%. And this is in a student population that seemed happy, right? So I think one thing is students um, are really good at hiding it, right? They put on the mask. They don't want to show weakness. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it's so isolating, I think they feel like they're the only ones who are really feeling this way. Um, so when we got those results, as associate dean for curriculum, I think um, maybe it was a little different for me, because usually it's student affairs who does this stuff, right? It's, it's student affairs who manages the wellness of medical students, and I think that's really problematic. Not that student affairs isn't able to do a good job with it. But my feeling was, like, I'm kind of responsible. I'm associate dean for curriculum. You know, we are doing this to them. And again, we had results that, from orientation that showed 4% rate of, of depression, you know, and so at that point, what, what I ended up doing is say, OK, again, like the good medical educator, I went to the medical education literature to say, well, what do we do about this, right? And what was fascinating about it is, as I said, not much was being done. And I would characterize it as kind of two, well, three phases before that. The first phase was probably 20 years ago and earlier, which was, hey, life is tough. Being a physician is tough. Get used to it. Suck it up. You know, that's it, right? Then I'd say maybe, maybe in the last 15 years or so, then it was, hey, we got a problem here. We better get them to get better access to mental health providers, right? So make it easier for them to see psychiatrists and psychologists get counseling. And then the third one is these wellness initiatives that have popped up everywhere. I'm sure you have here, right? Um, uh, which are good and necessary, but I don't think sufficient. Because oftentimes, at many places, it's information-based. Eat right, sleep, take care of yourself, exercise. Um, and, and while that's great, to me it's not enough. It's really not dealing with fundamental issues um, that occur in medical education. So there's not a really formal name, but a, just the Medical Student Mental Health Initiative. Um, very simple model, which was rather than waiting for students to get depressed or anxious, we said, why don't we try to prevent it, right? So we tried to do that in two ways. It was designed to reduce unnecessary stressors, and then on the other side, increase students' ability to deal with stress. And our feeling was, rather than like change one variable, see what happened, we, we wanted to throw everything we could at it. As long as it made sense, we were just going to throw everything we could. And over about six years, we, th we basically had a number of different um, inter interventions. So first one, uh, 2009, we changed to pass-fail grading in the first two years, developed these longitudinal electives, theme-based uh, learning communities, um, and basically cut the curriculum across the board by 10% to free up time for um, 
in the first two years for these longitudinal electives. So now, every other Wednesday, students have the full day, half a day for electives, half a day just for themselves. Um, so that was the first year. Second year, we introduced this mindfulness resilience curriculum, which I'll talk about in a moment. The following, um, we took on the human anatomy course. And um, I've become interested in this issue that, that I'm, I'm hopefully going to explore soon, uh, because I think this is really common. As, as I realized, while we were trying to do these things and create this nurturing environment, there was incredible power and ability of single course directors to undermine everything we were doing, right? I call it toxic course syndrome, and um, I think it's widespread, and I think it goes under-addressed, under the radar, isn't dealt with um, oftentimes, but through the backing of our dean, we basically told the anatomy course directors, you can't keep doing what you're doing. And we can go into what it was they were doing at the end if you want. But um, then we changed to true pass-fail. And Rena, I think you have that here. And I think our approach actually modeled yours, which was there are many pass-fails, very few true pass-fail. And what I call true pass-fail are those where your rankings in the first two years in courses have, aren't shared in the dean's letter, aren't used for AOA, are you not used for any honorifics? And so I think that's a huge step of better than just pass-fail. Pass-fail is an illusion. If your rankings still matter in your dean's letter, AOA, et cetera, it's not really pass-fail. What is um, theme-based learning Sorry. Yeah, theme-based learning curriculums, uh, or th theme-based learning communities, we have um, five of them. And, and they're kind of virtual communities that there's one for research, there's one for uh, service and advocacy, wellness, um, medical education, which is kind of this, this grouping of students and faculty who share common interests, who develop electives, offer noon conferences, um, work on projects together, those kind of things. Oh, shorten the preclinical curriculum. This was really designed not to reduce stress in the first two years, but to reduce stress at the end of the third year. So our students now finish three months earlier. That gives them five months to de determine their um, specialty, which I think that, that the old days of two months. Do you have a short? Yeah, something we can talk about at the end. The pressure on fourth year students in July and August to figure out what they want to do is really tough. Um, for some. And then this year we started uh, confidential tracking. All of our um, surveys had been anonymous. For the first year students, we give them the opportunity um, to fill these surveys out confidentially. Um, and, uh, and basically, if they screen positive for depression or anxiety, um, the results are shared with a mental health provider who then reaches out to the students. But only if they, they mark confidential. So who has that, that data? The only people who have that data uh, linked to the student's name is our mental health providers. No one in my office does. No, I don't. I never see it. Never see it. Unless the students want to talk to me about it. So it's, it's com they get a code. I won't go into the details, but we're able to keep it so literally the only people, and the only people that the mental health providers get are those who've, who've screened positive. They don't get all med students at all. Okay, and this is our results, and, and they're pretty dramatic. Um, so our pre-change group, class of 2011, 2012, I showed you before. 2017, we have our depression rate, or moderate to severe symptom of depression is down to 8%. Um, harder in the second year hasn't fallen as much, I think in part because there's a fixed stressor at the end of the year two that I can't do anything about. And frankly, the fact that it's staying stable at, in the you know, mid-teens is probably a good thing because I don't know your sense. I think the pressure on students for step one is ratcheting up every single year. As the competition for residency gets more intense, I think that's uh, intensifying. And depression or anxiety rates, we've dropped it from 56% down to 23%. Again, no surprise that the anxiety rate for second years is higher. We do it right at the end of the year as they face step, step one. Um, that 23% rate was gratifying because it was actually lower than the rate they came in with, which that seemed pretty amazing. Um, so, so 
pretty dramatic changes. And I guess one of the things I have to point out too about this is this cost almost nothing to do. Our entire budget for all of this right now is less than $5,000 a year. So, you know, a lot of this was just doing, you know, getting away from doing business as usual. Okay, and one uh, last slide about this in terms of the data, and, and apologies that this doesn't project so well, but depression scores high to low, uh, high on the right side, low on the left, and then the percent of students, uh, the black bars being the pre-change class and the, and the most recent class, class of 2017 being the white bars. We really looked at this because, you know, if, if our depression and anxiety rates dropped, it really could have been that we were just affecting the tail, right? The, the most affected students, if, but, but the other is that maybe we we're affecting the whole mood of the class, right? Maybe the, the entire curve was being shifted. And I think this, this slide shows really we we're doing both, the tail move, but what we also see is you see many white bars with extraordinarily low depression scores, right? So the, it, this isn't just reducing depression, the entire mood of this class, and, it, and you can feel it, is better, absolutely better. I told them um, this year when they came back as second year students that I had no question they were without doubt um, the mentally healthiest students in the history of St. Louis University Medical School, and we don't know, but maybe the most healthy medical students in the history of U.S. medical education. Maybe in Canada or elsewhere they're happier. <laughs> I don't know. They're pretty striking numbers. This is what our faculty was worried about. They said, Stuart, you're just making it easier for them. They aren't going to work as hard. No decrease in mean exam scores or increase in failure rates, of course. Mean step one scores have shown significant increase over that time. Now, it's gone up nationally. Um, but when you cut the curriculum by 10% and go to pass-fail, there were real fears that it would drop. Um, and we've stayed in line with everyone else. And your pre-curricular data, like your admissions data. Haven't changed. Haven't changed. Have not changed. And do you think that the kids who want a pass-fail school and a school that's having wellness and themes and communities might be a different cohort uh, coming in? The only thing I, uh, we don't know. Um, uh, is, the short, is the shorter answer. The longer answer is that, if anything, frankly, I, I worry it, it attracts more vulnerable students to us, you know? If students are going, oh my gosh, I want a like, less stressful environment, I think they might be more inclined to choose us, yeah. Um, so, I'm just gonna go through this quickly and we can return to this, because I do wanna make sure we save time for the end and I don't wear a watch, which is a problem when I'm lecturing. I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay on time. Um, but I do want to have time for a discussion because I think that's, there's a lot of richness in terms of where we're going because I, and, and, and where you might go too. Because I think one of the things I feel like is I don't have all the answers. And I should say, and before this section especially, I don't think I'm an expert on this in any kind of way. I've had no formal training. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. But I don't think you need to be to address these issues. You know, psychiatrists and psychologists can be immensely helpful. Um, but there's a lot here that, that is very accessible. Um, and I think it gives me an advantage in this work when I work with students on, on on a couple of bases. One, the sad truth is, we used to have a counselor who used to do the training, um, and they didn't take her seriously. Um, there's arrogance, at least in our medical students sometimes, that they want to hear from doctors, right? Um, and so now I do the lectures, um, and, and I think with my MD and my life experiences, it gives me kind of more credibility. Um, but, and hopefully we can again talk about this at the end. There's some amazing resources. And the other advantage I have is I approach this not from a standpoint that this is the answer, right? And when you start getting direct, you know, people who are um, uh, true believers, then sometimes it's like this solution is the only one you should do. And, and and my approach is the answer, and I don't, I don't have any allegiance to any single approach. So we, we approach this from the standpoint, there are all sorts of great tools out there. We present these to the students and say, it's up to you to choose. And frankly, some of the strategies and tools I'm going to talk to you about 
um, I feel have changed my life, which is pretty stunning to me because I was, you probably could not find a person who was more leery of the self-help, personal improvement kind of, the secret kind of whatever it was, right, to improve your life. But the key here is a huge amount of this is really grounded now in research and cognitive psychology. There's, there's evidence base to support a lot of what I'm going to talk about. So it's about three things in many ways. It's about mindfulness, it's about resilience, and metacognition. So mindfulness, paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment, moment and non-judgmentally. That's John Kabat-Zinn. Another definition. First component of mindfulness involves the self-regulation of attention so it is maintained on immediate experience. The second component involves adopting a particular orientation towards one's experiences in the present moment, an orientation that is characterized by curiosity, openness, and acceptance. Um, great spaces to try to achieve. Now, how to cultivate it? Um, formal practice is it's about meditation, right? And John Kabat-Zinn, who had that first, um, that first uh, definition, I think would probably say that to be truly mindful, you need to meditate for 30 to 45 minutes a day. Anybody here meditate 30 to 45 minutes a day? Um, way to go, Rena. Okay. Um, it's fantastic that you're able to do this. Um, many people will not, right? Find the time, the discipline, et cetera. And I think the key message of this is that to become more mindful, it isn't, doesn't require meditation. You, you may become more mindful if you meditate, but I, you can practice informally in a way that takes virtually no time or no extra time in your life at all. Um, and for really busy people, medical students, residents, physicians, what I want them to realize is don't give up on mindfulness if you can't find the time to meditate. Look for ways to develop it informally. Now here I'll ask anybody do informal practices at all? Do you think? Okay, informal practices. How do you do it? Um, meditation, I, Rena, you can comment on it, this, but I think that oftentimes people think meditation is about clearing your brain, right? And it's kind of that, but really it's about focusing attention on something like your breath and letting the uh, thoughts disappear, right? So, so it's actually kind of a heightened awareness and focus on one thing. That's what you're trying to achieve. And um, so what are different ways you can do it? One is mindful eating. So how many times do you like wolf down a meal, you finish and you go, oh my God, I didn't even like taste that. I have no idea what I just ate, right? Um, so slowing down and my daughter, and I, Rena knows this, we were in Paris. We did a lot of mindful eating there. <laughs> I've taught her how to do it. She, we were just like, oh, wait, just like, let's, let's not talk for a minute, right? So that was one. Another that um, people will do sometimes is, um, if you shower in the morning before you go to work, is, is not thinking about everything that's going on through, you know, that will happen during your day and playing things out. It's just focusing on the feeling of the water hitting your body and just focus on that, let the thoughts disappear. Um, I do things when I'm walking different places. Uh, one thing, after living in Los Angeles uh, for 20 years, um, I really like rain, okay? <laughs> rain is wonderful. And so sometimes in St. Louis, you probably get this here. I don't know if you do in the city. Do you get that? <laughs> I don't know if you do. But Central Park, you probably do that smell right after rain, a really nice spring rain has occurred. I love that smell. And just walking and focusing on that. So to some degree, it's focusing on one sense for a while and letting everything go. Um, and cultivating that in different ways, um, I think, is, is essential... Um, I, I, it's a great tool to have um, because what you also then can do is become more mindful about your emotions and more mindful about your thoughts, and especially when they're not serving you well. Resilience. Um, there are a number of different components that we provide students with uh, to build their resilience, and I think of all of them, this is the most important, which is cognitive restructuring. Um, cognitive restructuring is just based on cognitive behavioral therapy, and I always feel embarrassed about talking about this because I really don't know much about it. Other 
than the way it was explained to me is that we tend to go through life thinking adverse event equals outcome, right? Something bad happens in your life, that's what the outcome is, and it's not the case. It's adverse event plus your emotional reaction that equals the outcome. And a lot of times, you know, all you have to really affect the outcome in any kind of way is how you react to it. And sometimes, we, I see this with med students all this time, even def defining an event as being adverse is, is emotionally weighted, right? Other people may look at what you're calling an adverse event and say, wow, how, how'd you call that an adverse event? Doesn't seem to me. So our feeling is, well, why don't we teach students essentially the basic tenets of cognitive behavioral therapy before they get anxious? Why do we wait till they develop the pathology of having anxiety? It would seem to make sense to give them that, those tools right away. And we started from day one. And the concrete example I use, and I don't, did you use this here? Which is I um, tell the medical students, first week of medical school, I say you're going to have an exam Next week, it's going to be your first exam in medical school, and I can say with complete confidence that half of you are going to fall below the median. Okay. And there's often like a little nervous laughter out there because they hadn't really thought about that, I think. And I said, for many of you, if not all of you, never will you have worked so hard for such an academic outcome, right? such a poor academic outcome. And talking with students in the past, uh, there will be voices in your head that are going to say, you know, that, that are going to talk to you. And what are those voices going to say? What do you think those voices are going to be? You can't make it. You just quit now. You shouldn't have gone to med school. You're never going to make it as a doctor. If you become a doctor, you're going to be a lousy doctor, right? And every one of those is a cognitive distortion. Every one of them. Um, that's catastrophization. It's just the first exam in med school. Okay? There are going to be 40 more. Right? And somebody's going to have to be below average, right? And does really being below average in the first two years in biochemistry or whatever, does that really predict how you're going to perform as a doctor? No. Right? So, so there are all these, you know, things that, that, um, uh, that distortions which exist, which are really damaging, and I think medical students are really prone to. Because the vast majority of them have been at the top of everything. And even in a pass-fail system, a true pass-fail system, their identity is still wrapped up in academic performance, right? So we need to teach them how to dispute those, and one, there are a number of different strategies. I won't go into them except for one, which is one way to dispute them is, let's say rather than you had this outcome that it was your best friend who um, had this outcome. Best friend comes up to you and said, oh my gosh, I got below average on this test in medical school. Would you say to them, well, you should quit now. You know, you're never going to make it. You shouldn't be in med school. You, you know, you're stupid, right? Of course not, right? So, so the weird thing is, if you're not going to say it to your friend, why, do we, why are we okay with talking to ourselves that way? And that's where some of the mindfulness is, is starting to see the, the pattern of, of really toxic, destructive thoughts that exist. Maladaptive perfectionism, imposter syndrome, I've gotten much more interested in these. Maladaptive perfectionism is always setting the bar so high you're continually dis disappointed with yourself. Imposter syndrome um, is, is the sense that um, you're really not competent, you're just fooling people, and it's only a matter of time before people discover it. I think that's particularly a, a very frightening risk at the start of residency. Um, where people who can graduate with all sorts of honorifics get into, into residency and feel like, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. Why aren't the, the patients coming in and asking me if they have A, B, C, D, or E, right? Patients aren't a multiple choice test, and some really struggle with that uncertainty. So huge risk there that we're just starting to explore. Negativity of bias, and I'm going to run through the rest of these more quickly. Negativity bias is just being aware that we are hardwired to have negative events in our lives have more of an impact emotionally and a longer duration of impact than positive ones. And just being aware of that gives you the idea, okay, I'm wired to react this way. I've got to try to work to keep negative events in perspective. Optimistic versus pessimistic explanatory style. We tend to have um, 
an approach to the world that tends to be more optimistic or pessimistic. It used to be felt that that was fixed, that you were either an optimist or you were a pessimist by the time you were an adult, and that was going to stay the same. An interesting study in Notre Dame um, uh, University um, looked at roommates who had different um, orientations in terms of explanatory style, one optimistic, one pessimistic. By the end of the year, they were, they were closer together in terms of their style but it seemed like the negative or the pessimistic had more gravitational pull than the positive, right? Which I think we can all relate to. Positive emotions, uh, cultivating uh, positive emotions. Um, study done at Duke that hasn't been published, which I think uh, about three good things. Three good things, very simple to do at the end of the day, at the end of, um, you know, I, when you're about to go to sleep, you have a journal next to your bed and you write three good things that happened to you. And they can get, be big things. If it was a patient care thing where you really made a difference, fantastic. Um, they can be trivial things. They can be, you know, the burrito I had for lunch was superb, you know? It's looking for little pieces of joy. Um, and what this guy at Duke did is he had residents do it for two weeks. Only two weeks, that was it. Six months later, he looked at mental health of those medical students, burnout, um, and they were less burned out than people who had not, two weeks of intervention. And I think part of that is, and we worked with undergrad students recently, pre-med students on this. I always, I've never done three good things because I'm pretty positive about things and I don't think that's a tool I need. There's another tool I use that I'll tell you about in a moment. But that what they said is, it wasn't at the end of the day that they just that started thinking about um, what good things happened. It changed the way they looked at the day. They started looking for the good things and recognizing them and embracing them, which I thought is really powerful. It takes no time to do. Positive inquiry, I think, is more something for the clinical years, which is, you know, residents, medical students tend to, you know, you get two or three med students or residents together in the clinical years, and it's usually the, the, the conversation often spirals down. Oh, I had the worst call night. Oh no, I had the worst call night, mine was worse. I had the worst patient, they were so, the family was impossible. No, 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 I had one worse, right? And we don't tend to tell really good stories and they're out there, they're out there. And when you hear those stories and seek them out, to me, really easy to elevate positive emotions. Avoiding learned helplessness, I think this is particularly more of a problem in residency where oftentimes residents get into a situation where they start feeling like their happiness is determined by the residency program. That they have no control, they have no autonomy, um, and so it's up to the residency to make them happy and that's a horrible, dangerous place to be. No, your happiness is up to you. It can be difficult, but, but um, you have to give that away, right? Um, Nobody will take that away, so it's, it's up to you um, to, to try to figure out how to create your own happiness. And then emotional self-regulation, this is the one um, that I think was most impactful for me. Um, a tool I use, which is really great, again, because it doesn't take any time at all. Um, and I guess where I felt I, I suffered the most from this poor emotional self-regulation was not at work. I kept it together at work, but at the end of the day when I went home, um, I think I was more emotionally reactive with my family than I, than I should have been, right? And, and I think it was a situation where, like, they needed stuff for me, but I'd given everything at work. And I bet everybody who's a clinician can relate to that feeling, right? And it was unfair, and then there's a cycle of feeling really bad about yourself because you know you're being a jerk, right? And they don't deserve this, but controlling is hard. So this is the tool I used, which is there's something called red light mindfulness by, by the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, which I don't use because we don't really have a lot of traffic in St. Louis. It would have been great in Los Angeles, and traffic doesn't make me crazy. But his is, if you're in traffic and somebody does something stu stupid or you, and you're like, like ready to kill somebody, right? You're just like, oh my God. Um, what you're supposed to do in that situation is recognize that those symptoms. Um, take one deep mindful breath in and out, smile physically, and say out loud, thank God I'm alive, okay? Um, I don't do that, but I do a variation on it, which I call um, grocery line mindfulness. <laughs> it's really good because grocery lines, 
used to make me, and I can say this past tense, grocery lines made me insane, okay? Because, and this is not a cognitive distortion, you would think you would only choose the wrong line like 50% of the time, right? No, every time I would choose the wrong line and it would be wrong for, it would always move slowly and, and there would be like, you know, the, the person who forgets an item and they have to run back or, or the, the cashier gets into a long conversation or the worst, the one that would make me nuts is, is the person who would write a check you, do people write checks in line? I mean, and you're like, how, we're like, this is 2015, what are you doing? A check, and then they write the information in their check register too? And you're like, oh my God. And so I'd be like, I would just be like going psycho. A security line mindfulness too, you can do this as well. So what I do now is you recognize the symptoms of rage, which is not hard to recognize. And then all I do, I don't do the smile and say out loud, thank God I'm alive. I'd worry about that. I don't, I, 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 that would be a little bizarre. But, but internally, all I do is something very simple, and it's very easy to do, which is recognize the symptoms and create space. And in that space, you make it a choice. Do I really want to be pissed off? Or do I take this as a mindfulness test and, and relax? Just relax. Is the anger, frustration going to make me feel better? Is it going to make the line move any faster? No. And I've even cured myself, because what I would always do is try to figure out if the other line, if, like at some point, should I switch the other line? I've given up on that. I stick with my line, I just stay there, and I don't worry about it. And, it is, and it's this weird little sanctuary, which is just lovely, where nobody's going to want anything from me, and I just kind of slow down. And the neat thing about this is the, those stressors in life create the same sympathetic response. So the physical symptoms are the same, whether it's a grocery line or my 17-year-old daughter, like, making me completely nuts, right? Um, same symptoms. And now with her or my wife or in other situations, I create space and then say, it's hard, I'm gonna make a choice. And I'm not perfect at home, I wanna make sure that's clear. I mean, but the vast majority of times I make a choice of being patient and compassionate and not blowing up when they don't deserve it. So I love that one. It's, I, it has, it has um, changed my life because I think the better you get at it, the better you get at it. The more you use it, there's more, there, that self-efficacy occurs. And then this last piece, which is all of the above, above uh, rely to a great degree on metacognition. It's being able to look at your own kind of thinking, thoughts, et cetera. Um, and, and, and decide if they're serving you well. Okay, last segment. I was gonna end here, but I wanted, a lot of our work is really focused on the first two years. And we're starting just a lot in the next few minutes. I just wanna talk about, the third year's tougher. Our, our, our results are not so good. Um, they, they've improved and now are stable, which I think stable right now, again, as I said, in this environment, is probably not a bad thing. Because I, I see our students under increasing stress every year, and it's going to get worse, right? As this gap between residency positions and, and medical school graduates closes and the applications for process for residency gets more intense, it's going to get worse. So one of the themes of my work, which I think has really turned out to be very important, is I think when we're designing interventions, I think the more I understand the lived experience of the people I'm trying to help, the better off I am in, in designing the right kind of interventions. And again, so I started looking into this and is what are the stressors in the third year? What are the demoralizing, disheartening factors that, that make students suffer so badly? And I think if you look at the medical education literature and if you look at the AAMC and what they're concerned about, by far what you would say is it's mistreatment. Mistreatment, I mean, uh, the, the graduation questionnaire, it's, it's like pages on mistreatment by faculty, residents, nurses, et cetera. Um, but again, we did something I think which was interesting, which was the following. We decided to ask the students, 
right? Let's not just assume it's mistreatment, which is, you know, which is causing them to suffer. And so what we asked them about was dis demoralizing, disheartening, and then also stressful factors in the clerkship year. Did a focus group, and they came up with about 25 different potential things that they th thought could have a negative impact. And then we pulled a bunch from the graduation questionnaire, uh, all of their mistreatment stuff, and we found uh, uh, um, some interesting results. So three consecutive classes surveyed at the end of their third year. Students rated the degree with, to which 25 factors were demoralizing. It just wasn't whether it occurred. It's like how much of an emotional impact was, did it have on them. Five point Likert scale, zero not at all, to four extreme, all right? Anonymous survey response rate was 78%, and this is what it looked like. So the factors that were two or above were the following. Working with unhappy residents was the highest. Working with unhappy faculty was the next, feeling ignored by residents, not feeling part of the team, feeling incompetent, receiving unfair evaluations from faculty, receiving unfair evaluations from residents. Those were our top, what, seven? Those were our top seven. Next, between one and 1.9, being ignored by attendees, culture of negativity in medicine, working with unhappy nurses, same themes as we saw above. And not until you get down to 1.6 do you hear anything about mistreatment. So nonverbal mistreatment, residents attending, verbal mistreatment, attendees, residents feeling ignored by nurses, nonverbal um, mistreatment by nurses. Caring for very sick or dying patients, that's not disheartening or de demoralizing to them. Discrimination, sexual harassment, you know, very little impact as well. So I think one of the things that I think is a terrible mistake that medical educators are focusing on is getting rid of eliminating mistreatment. One, we're never going to get rid of it. Second is even if we get rid of it and you still have really unhappy faculty and residents who are just managing to restrain themselves not to mistreat people, there's no evidence that it's going to have a positive impact on the students. So right now, our focus is, well, I'll tell you my focus. My focus right now making happier residents, can talk about that at the end a little bit as well, improving the evaluation system, um, which is a mess, and I think it's a mess nationally. The subjective natures and the unfairness of evaluations is, is, is really a problem. Let me just go back up to the others. Um, oh, and we're, we're working on the feeling incompetent piece. And, and two ways, one is we've, we've never had a significant orientation to the third year. It used to be a half day. So now we, this year we're starting a one week orientation where we're really gonna focus in on design by fourth year students for the third year students. What do you need to know to enter into that, that third year? Um, and a concept which I've really am becoming inter, interested in is learning to embrace that feeling of incompetence and realizing everybody feels it. That's a part of moving up the ladder. Um, being vulnerable as a physician is something we all have, right? Um, and, you, and you can't just let it pretend it's not there and you need to kind of, you need to work through it in some kind of way. I think I will stop there. It's kind of a journey we're still on. I wish I had all the answers. I guess one of the things I feel like we're asking the right questions at least. And that's a key, key part of what we're doing. So thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>